Hello there. I'm going to move on now to the, the last section on feeding large animals and that's feeding them concentrates. So we're going to work our way through that session now. Um, so far we've talked about forage and water intake for large animals and in many animals on a maintenance diet they only need water and forage. So if they're a healthy adult animal that is not growing, is not pregnant, is not injured, is not recovering, often they'll just require uh, water and forage to meet all their daily energy and nutrient requirements. However, a lot of our patients are pregnant or lactating or growing or in heavy exercise or sick or injured or convalescing, and those animals may need a higher energy or nutrient intake than they can obtain from water and forage alone. Nevertheless, we're still trying to meet what we call a balanced diet. You've probably heard that term, but what it specifically means is that when the animal gets all its energy intake in feed in a day, it also has obtained all the nutrients it needs to allow it to maintain healthy tissues in a functional body system. So a balanced diet is one where when the animal eats enough food to meet its energy requirements, it's also obtained all the nutrients that it needs as well. And obviously our aim in practice is to give our patients a balanced diet, but we'll sometimes find that's a bit tricky if they have, say, a medical condition or an injury that stops them eating their normal feed or diet. If what we want in an animal like this, where you can see that the animal is in good body condition, generally on a scale of zero to five, where zero is emaciated and five is obese, we want our animals in and around the three, two and a half, three, three and a half, depending on their exact physiological demands. For example, a fit athlete, if you take a racehorse, they'll have a body condition score of about two and a half. Whereas if that horse was a mare and she finished her racing career and she went to stud, we'd want her to have a body condition score of probably three and a half when she falls down. However, if the animal is one out of five, they're too thin. If they're four out of five or five out of five, they're overweight and there's increased risk of, of health problems. So we want body condition score in that middle range. So again, that's an important practical skill to, to practice. Get your hands on as many animals as you can and familiarize yourself with body condition scoring. And other things like in this particular photograph, you can see this calf has a shiny glossy coat. Hair is made from protein. So if the animal has an unbalanced diet, if for example, it's too low in protein to meet the animal's requirements, they'll often have a dry, brittle or harsh looking hair coat and no amount of brushing or cleaning will put that healthy shine onto them. So by evaluating the animal both visually and by palpating it, we can get a feel for the likely adequacy of their diet. So when we talk about concentrate feeds as an addition to a diet of water and forage, what we're talking about are um, a feed that's given to the animal to help it to grow or to repair or produce tissue optimally. So it's given to the animal in addition to the forage and water it needs for a maintenance diet rather than replacing them. So we're talking here about adding concentrates to a diet that already contains forage and water. Generally with concentrate feeds, they're higher in energy than um, forage. That energy is normally in the form of starch, which is a rapidly um, metabolizable form of, of energy. So both microbial and, and digestive enzymes from mammals can break starch down into smaller monosaccharides as an energy source. We'll also find higher levels of protein in many concentrate feeds. Sorry, that's my phone ringing. And they may have added nutrients as well, depending on their diet of the animal that it's intended for. When we're talking about our large animal patients, they're generally herbivores. So they're going to have a, a diet that's based on plants. And the highest energy, highest protein part of a plant is generally the seed. So grain refers to seeds of plants that are grown and cultivated as an energy source or a concentrate feed source for both animals and humans. So we're talking about things like oats, barley, maize, depending on the part of the world you're in. Um, we may find alfalfa sometimes in, in concentrate feeds as well. I'll talk you through some examples of them later in the, in the lecture. But keep in mind, we're talking about a plant based diet here. The other thing about concentrate feeds is that unlike forage, which is generally produced on the farm the animal lives on. So we talked about hay and silage and other means of preserving forage to keep the animals going over the winter or when they're, they're housed. Generally, um, so traditionally farms did grow their own concentrates in the form of oats in this part of the world. 
In recent years, as farming has intensified, more and more farmers and horse owners buy their concentrate feed in. It's not produced on farm. So it's more expensive and a lot of the ingredients are imported. So if you take, say, the picture here is of a concentrate feed for large animals and you can see those bright yellow um, kernels in it. They are maize and maize doesn't fruit in Ireland. We can grow maize here, but it doesn't produce seed heads on it. Our climate is too too cold. So we'll find ourselves importing a lot of concentrate feed ingredients. So there is a environmental impact to this as well. If we think then about a hospitalised large animal, how are we going to know how much to feed it? And how are we going to know, does it need concentrates or not? So we know we have to give it water. We know we have to give it forage. But the third part of that intake is, do we need to give them concentrates as well? So there's a couple of um, pointers here I'm going to talk you through. If you've worked with large animals before, you'll intuitively or instinctively know how to feed them. Um, but you may find yourself encountering species you haven't looked after before, or this may be a an aspect of animal care you've no experience with. So the good news is there are some criteria you can use to figure out. So the first useful figure we're going to talk about is this two to three percent of their body weight daily in dry matter. So our patients will generally eat, we'll tend to use two percent as the, the basic um, number. So we'll assume this horse here for example, um, if he weighs 500 kilos, he's going to eat two percent of his body weight in dry matter daily. So if you take 500 kilos, Divide it by 100 to get 1%, that's 5 kilograms. Double it to get 2%, that's 10 kilograms. So this horse, on a maintenance diet, is going to eat about um, 10 kilograms of dry matter daily in the form of forage. If this horse was pregnant or was injured or was in very high work, then it would need more energy, it would need a higher proportion of its dry matter to come from concentrates, and we'd start to add concentrates into the diet to allow the animal to maintain its body condition in the face of a higher energy output, be that producing a fetus or exercising heavily or healing from surgery, for example. But it is important that we do this in a balanced manner. We talked in ANP1 about how critically important the microbial population in the ruminant four stomachs or in the hindgut of the hindgut fermenters is to maintain and digestive health. So what we don't want to do is just suddenly switch this animal from a high forage diet to a, a high concentrate diet without giving the microbes time to adapt. And that's important to th keep in mind when you're hospitalizing these patients. They're in their normal routine at home, they come into your hospital and they have kind of a major lifestyle change to contend with. So let's give you an example. Let's say we have a 550 kilogram suckler cow and she's been brought into your hospital. She's been admitted under your care for a few days and your job is, is to feed her. So we know she'll eat 2% of her body weight daily in dry matter. So we'll start off by working at that out. So if we take her body weight, 550 kilos, and divide it by 100, that will give us 1% of her body weight is 5.5 kilos. We want 2%. So 5.5 kilos multiplied by 2 is 11 kilograms. So this cow will eat 11 kilograms of her body weight in dry matter. So 11 kilos dry matter a day is what we want to give her. So let's say on her home farm she's been fed silage and typically silage has a dry matter content of about 25 to 30 percent. So the farmer can tell you and we got her silage analysed and this year's silage has a dry matter content of 28 percent. So how much silage is this cow accustomed to eating in her home farm environment? We want to work out that. So how do you do that? The silage is 28 percent dry matter. That dry matter is nutrients plus indigestible parts of the plant, like lignin, and the rest is water. So 28 from 100 is 72, so 72% of the silage is water. Um, we know the cow will, will eat 11 kilos of dry matter. So on this silage-based diet, this 11 kilograms of dry matter corresponds to 28% of the silage. So we have 28%. We know that 11 kilos is 28%. We want to know how much is 100% because that's how much silage the farmer will have to give to this cow every day. So if we take 11 kilos and divide it by 28, that will give us 1%, multiply it by 100, so it's 11, divide it by 28, and then multiply it by 100, and your answer is 39.3 kilograms, or just, just under 40 kilograms of silage daily. So if you picture 40 kilograms of silage, that's quite a large pile of silage, that's how much 
that cow is going to eat. Now, on her home farm, she's helping herself to that from around feeder or from silage on the ground outside her pen or from the front of a silage pit that's been opened. That's impractical for us to do in the hospital. In the hospital, we're going to change her onto a hay-based diet. Hay is much lighter. It's easier to transport. It's widely used in veterinary practices to feed cattle because of the convenience of using it rather than trying to give them silage. And it's, again, a good source of forage. However, we know that hay is made by drying grass, so hay has a much higher dry matter percentage. In this case, we've had our hay tested and we know its dry matter content is 85%, which is fairly typical for hay. 85 to 90% is, is fairly standard. Okay. So this cow is still going to eat 11 kilograms of dry matter daily, but this time we're giving it to her in the form of hay. So this time, that 11 kilos corresponds to 85%. We want to know how much 100% is. So it's 11 divided by 85 and then multiply your answer by 100. That's going to work out at 12.9 or just under 13 kilograms of hay daily. So if you picture um, 13 kilograms of hay in a pile beside the 40 kilograms of silage, it's a much smaller pile. It's less, less bulky, but it contains the same amount of dry matter. So you can see why that's more convenient to use in a hospital. The hay is lighter and easier to transport, but the cow will still eat the same amount of dry matter to meet her needs if we offer her 13 kilograms of hay daily instead of 40 kilograms of silage. So the key thing here is to recognize that the dry matter intake in those two quantities is the same. What's different is the water proportion. Now let's say this cow has had surgery and we want to give her some concentrates to help her recover from the surgery. She wants a higher energy diet or let's say she's got a calf at foot and she's lactating. So we might decide to replace 20% of the dry matter with concentrate feed. Okay. As a rule of thumb, about 20-25% of dry matter as concentrate intake is not going to upset the animal's digestive tract too much. If we start increasing the concentrate proportion to 30%, 40%, we're starting to push the microbes a bit. If it gets to 50% or beyond, digestive problems are pretty much guaranteed. The forage intake of the animal becomes too low to maintain intestinal health. So you'll find only a very small number of animals are fed concentrates in that quantity. And usually it's things like, say, high yield dairy cows or, you know, rapidly grown racehorses who are in full training or full work where they're um, under a lot of physiological demand and they're being cared for in an expert manner by people who have access to nutritionists. So it's not something we'll routinely do in practice. Generally, we'll try and keep our concentrate intake to, you know, no more than a third of the animal's diet. So in this case, we're going for 20% or one fifth of the dry matter being replaced um, by concentrate feed instead of hay. Now, the concentrate feed is sitting in a bag in your feed house. You can go and look on the label and figure out that the dry matter content of this feed is 90%, which makes sense if you, your, if you handle concentrate feed or um, coarse mix, it's quite dry. So there's not much water in there. So we want to take 20% of our 11 kilograms or one fifth of it. So if we take 11 kilograms, divide it by 100, multiply it by 20, or you can take your 11 kilograms and multiply it by point, um, 0 0.2, we'll end up with 2.2 kilograms. So we're going to take 2.2 kilograms of the 11 kilograms and give that in the form of concentrate feed. The remainder, um, just under nine kilograms, will be given in the form of hay. So if we just give this cow 2.2 kilograms of concentrate feed, that's, that's going to be not enough. We'll leave her with energy deficit. We're not allowing for the water. That 2.2 kilograms is 90% of the dry matter. Okay, the other 10% is water. So we have 90%. We want 100. So we take our 2.2 kilos, divide it by 90, and multiply it by 100, which gives us 2.4 kilograms. So 2.4 kilos of concentrates daily is what we're going to offer to this cow. We'll take our new hay intake of 11 kilograms, subtract our uh, 2.4 kilograms, and we're going to end up giving the cow 10.4 kilograms of hay daily. So that's what she's going to end up with. Okay. Now, in reality, if you're used to feeding large animals, you won't need to sit down and work this out for every patient. But as I said, it is important you've got some sort of rule of thumb to use if it's an unfamiliar species. If, for example, let's say you come into work and find you've got an alpaca in your hospital, that mightn't be a species you're familiar with. So 
If you understand this principle, you can work out how much to feed the animal. If the animal is sick or malnourished, you may have to work out um, how much to feed it, particularly if the animal is very, very thin. We'll talk about this a bit later on. It's very tempting to see a poor thin animal and feel sorry for them and offer them loads and loads of high energy um, concentrate feed. But you actually risk killing them if you do that. There's a thing called refeeding syndrome where the metabolic pathways just can't cope with this influx of energy rich food. The digestive tract is emaciated and the animal can end up dying from this rapid change in diet that their body is unable to cope with. So very important for very thin or malnourished animals that we you know, use science to refeed them in, in a safe manner and also client education. You'll have some clients who might be getting, say, a pony for their children or they're moved to the countryside and they want to keep some farm animals and they just don't know how to feed them. They're asking you for advice. So it is important you have a rule of thumb that you can sit down and, and work through with people. Um, another thing to keep in mind, I suppose, is that we mentioned this already, but that people think that concentrate feeds are always good and that more is better the animal grow faster and be healthier and look nice and shiny and sleek and it's kind of seen as a a way to to mine the animal but we do have to recognize that like everything in life in life too much of it can be um, a problem first of all it's, it's an expensive way to feed the animal forage is generally more environmentally sustainable um, and less inclined to make the animal overweight so lots of concentrates are expensive they're wasteful of the resources because the animal is getting fat and the animal can end up developing health problems. So obesity can lead to increased problems given birth, joint problems, um, you know, earlier uh, onset of infertility and cancer and so on. So a fat animal is not necessarily a healthy animal. And also the environment. If we're spending loads of money importing concentrate feeds from overseas, we're burning diesel and fuel to get them here, we're contributing to the carbon output, um, rather than using locally sourced plants that can feed the animal in a more sustainable way. It's it's obviously not good for the environment. And then the other thing, as we mentioned already, it's really important for these either ruminant or hindgut fermenters to have access to enough roughage and forage in their diet to maintain their intestinal health. So that's kind of an overview of concentrate feeding. At this point now, I want to go on and talk a little bit about the types of concentrates you're likely to have in your practice to give the animal. And we'll divide them into two main groups. You've got straits and compounds. Um, straits are single feedstuffs or individual grain crops like oats or barley or maize or soya. Um, they can either be fed as they are or sometimes they're mixed together before feeding. Generally, they're the, they're the seeds of um, plants that have been grown as an energy source for humans or animals. They tend to be high in starch and low in protein. So that's at a macro molecular level, they tend to be um, energy dense, but lower in proteins, particularly plant based um, protein sources. They may also give the animal a calcium phosphorus imbalance. So, for example, feeding lots of cereals to young, rapidly growing animals can reduce in inadequate calcification of the skeletal system. And animals can develop rickets or um, deformities of the bones or the skeletal system due to a poor quality diet while they're while they're growing rapidly and that's irreversible once the bones are pro improperly formed you can't reverse it so feeding straight while it's traditional it does take a bit of um, skill and knowledge some examples um oats are the traditional cereal that's grown in this country or this part of the world for hundreds of years to feed um concentrates to, to large animals and they're also eaten by humans so your porridge is obviously made from oats it's an elongated grain you'll see it grown it's oats is basically a, a type of cultivated grass so it has this characteristic um curved stalk with individual seeds hanging off in these little um husks like like bluebells so you'll see oats grown in the countryside um in the spring and summer they're harvested and used either to make porridge for humans or to as an animal feed they're higher energy and that's what oats look like then when they're after they've been harvested and they're removed from the husk and you have these long, narrow grains with tapered ends. And the husk itself is quite indigestible for before they're fed to animals, they're traditionally rolled or crushed. And you can see in this case, they've been flattened out. They're starting to look a bit more like porridge now. And you can see the white starch on the inside is now visible, which increases the speed at which they can be digested. So that makes them easier for the animal to, to digest. Um, 
barley grows well in our climate as well it has shorter darker grains than than oats and a re even tougher husk if you try and chew barley you'll find it's got a very very tough um outer husk so it's it's never fed whole it'll just go straight through the animal they can't digest it but it must be rolled or crushed um a lot of it now is what we call extruded where as it's been rolled the rollers are heated and that partially cooks it makes it more digestible so this is um barley grown in a field it has this characteristic beard or long um prickly stalks extending from the seed heads out towards the end of the plant the barley grains are arranged in this little v-shaped parallel rows along the the head of the stalk and then when we um harvest it and remove the grains of barley from the from the stalks and the beard you get these kind of wider fatter grains than the oats they're a bit plumper looking We've mentioned how tough the husk is so before it's fed it's usually flattened and again you get this kind of um appearance of the white inside is visible through the now flattened or crushed outer husk another one to mention is um, maize which is sweet corn or corn it's grown in warmer climates so very much in the in the usa it's an important animal feed it's high very high in energy um and again if you've had if you've made popcorn you've taken dried maize grains and heated them to cause them to burst or crack um, if you feed it as it is, you can imagine trying to eat un unpopped popcorn. It's very, very hard. It's very difficult for the animal to digest. So rather than making popcorn, what we tend to do for them is flake maize. Make corn flakes, basically. So um, Kellogg's corn flakes are flaked maize for humans. Corn flakes for animals um, is just called flake maize or yellow meal or Indian meal or American meal or Clarendo, depending on the part of the country you're from. And... You're basically taking the, the ear of a sweet corn, you're removing the kernels, drying them, and then flattening them out into these, cooking them into these little yellow cornflake like um, appearance. And you'll see that in animal feed. Animals tend to like it, it's very palatable, but it is very high energy, it can make them a bit wound up if you if you overdo it. Just to mention soya, then again, it doesn't grow in this part of the world, but it is widely cultivated as a human animal food. Um, if we take the seeds of the soya plant they're these little beans um if you've had edamame in a japanese restaurant you've had fresh um soya beans whereas when they're dried they go this kind of pale yellow color and then they're again they're very hard so they're ground into meal and you get this soya bean meal or soya flour which is a good pr source of protein so it's often added to animal feed particularly say for young or rapidly grown animals just to mention wheat um it's another cereal that's widely grown but the vast majority of wheat is used to produce bread and flour for human consumption. It's not commonly fed to animals. Um, what wheat looks like is on the left there we have uh, wheat grown in as it is in the field on stems. Then we have the grains removed for milling. And then finally on the right hand side you've got white flour where the, the wholemeal flour, the husk has been removed and we're left with the white centre. A few other ones. Um, linseed is the seed of the flax plant. Now in Ireland we have a tradition of growing flax and um, particularly in the northern half of the country to produce linen. So um, in Belfast and the north of Ireland there's a, a, an industry to produce Irish linen using the flax plant fibres from the stems. But the seeds are also used, they're, they're palatable. Um, however, it's important to note they are poisonous when they're raw. So they, they're a very good source of omega-3 fatty acids and vegetable oils but they must be um, cooked before they're fed to animals. The seeds themselves are, are dark in colour and have this lovely silky texture. So you can buy, um, say, linseeds to put into um, porridge or muesli in, in human health food shops. And if you run your hands through them, they have this lovely silky texture. Um, flax grown has this characteristic lovely blue flower. So you'll see fields of, of these blue flowers in the summer where flax is grown. The seeds themselves are small and they have this kind of shiny appearance. There's different um, go back there a sec. There's different types of them. Some of them are uh, this kind of traditional brown colour, others are paler. Before they were fed to animals, they were traditionally boiled to make a sort of a, a linseed jelly or a gruel, but nowadays they're often milled up after they've been cooked and added to the added to the feed. Uh, sunflowers as well. You can use sunflower seeds as an energy source and also they have some amino acids in them. Uh, you can also use sunflower oil. So if you take sunflower seeds and dry them and crush them, you get sunflower oil, so flora. It's a good energy source. It's very energy dense, but most animals don't like it, particularly um, herbivores. 
You can try adding a small bit of sunflower oil to their feed if you want to increase their energy intake. It's useful for, say, thin animals. But if you overdo it, they'll just turn their nose up at the feed. It's not very palatable. Um, you know what sunflowers look like, presumably. And if you've been in France in your holidays in the summer, you'll see fields of them being grown for, for sunflower seed production. And the seeds themselves are this characteristic kind of greeny colour. You can also mill them into, into sunflower seed um, flour, basically, to add to feed. Beans and peas, we mentioned um, leguminous plants already. These are plants that can fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere in their roots and produce high energy and high protein feeds. Um, so bees and peas are beans and peas are the seeds of um, these plants. They can be dried and added to the feed. Excuse me, they're a good protein source. So you'll see um, bean, beans and peas in some animal concentrate feeds as well. Um, brewer's greens, just to mention, um, this is barley that's been malted or uh, used to produce alcohol. So if you if you want, if you have, say, a distillery and you're making uh, whiskey or gin, you buy in barley seeds, you heat the barley and wet it and leave it for a few days. And that causes the, the grain to start to sprout and this enzymatic action in the grain as it starts to grow is releases um, carbohydrates. Yeast is added then and the yeast ferments the carbohydrates into alcohol. That's obviously the, the aim when you're making, say, whiskey or, or gin or whatever. Um, the alcohol is then removed and distilled to purify it. And the leftover barley um, is called malted barley or brewer's grains. At this point, it's a byproduct and it's often fed to dairy cows. However, it's, it's wet because it was heated during the brewing process. So it doesn't keep. Um, if you have a local brewery or distillery, they'll often give the grains to local farmers as a, a supplement. Apparently cows really like it and farmers are happy to feed them if they can get it, but it's not commercially available. It's usually on a, on a local basis. So there are some of the straights. There's lots of other ingredients as well. Um, 50 years ago, you know, everyone fed their horses oats and barley to their cattle and that was about it. That was what was available. And there's a story about Vincent O'Brien in 1968. He went to the sales in Keeneland in Kentucky and he bought a, a yearling, a one-year-old racehorse and brought him back to Tipperary in Ireland where he was training. Um, it was the first time he'd bought a horse from North America. And when he got back to Ireland, they they offered the horse oats, which is what all Irish racehorses were fed at the time. And the horse wouldn't eat the oats. And they were very surprised. So they rang his breeder, which was in a Winfields farm in Canada, and the breeder said, oh, yeah, no, we don't feed our horses oats. We feed them, we feed them nuts. And Vincent O'Brien was like, what are, what are nuts? And they said, oh, it's a, a compound feed now that we buy from a, a company here. He said, we'll send you some. So they put a, a bag of um, nuts that the horse was used to eating into, into the post. But by the time they made their way from Canada to Tipperary, the horse had started to eat oats. And he went on to win the Triple Crown in 1970. He was called Nijinsky. But at the time, in the late 60s, Commercial animal feed companies were just starting to get set up and start to produce commercial compounded feeds. So instead of a farmer having to grow oats and barley and produce hay on their farm, um, the companies were setting up. They were importing grains and cereals or buying them locally. They were mixing them together and they were producing a balanced feed that you could just buy um, to feed your dairy cows or your calves or your horses or your store cattle or your pregnant yews or whatever you wanted so it's a bit like buying dog food there's different companies making it there's different types of diets depending on the animal's age and lifestyle and breed and so on so instead of having to do it all locally these companies now formulate feeds to meet the nutritional requirements of various animal species and they've become more and more popular it's very obviously very convenient you can put more of your land over then to produce an animals. You don't have to keep some bit aside to produce compound um, cereal feeds for the animals. So it allowed stocking rates on farms to go. But I suppose it's part of intensification of farming that we've seen in the last 50 years. And also it um, is very convenient. It's much easier to go down to the shop and buy a bag of feed than it is to grow barley or wheat or oats and cut them and harvest them and trash them and mill them and... You know, if you look back at 100 years ago, um, people spent an awful lot of time harvesting cereals to feed themselves their animals over the winter, whereas now you can just go out and buy them. So it's it's convenient. 
From our point of view, we're talking about usually sort of 15 to 25 kilogram bags of feed. You can see this bag of spillers, horse and pony cubes is 20 kilograms. They're designed to be palatable, so most animals will eat them. And they come in two main forms. If you open up these bags, you tend to find either nuts in there or coarse mix. So nuts were the first invention. These are the ones that Vincent O'Brien's yearling wouldn't eat. They're sometimes called cubes or pencils or pellets. And basically to make this, the feed company takes all the ingredients that they want to put into the finished product so they might take some oats and barley and soya bean and they grind them all down into into powder they mix all the powders together in the cor correct proportions then they wet them and they form the push the the mix kind of like a slurry push it through pipes to make these little cylinders that then dry and break up into fragments so they're easy for the companies to make easy for the animals to pick up um, they're less dusty, but they can be a bit boring. So they tend to look like this sort of little um, dry cubes or pencils of concentrate feed. And they have a nice kind of a characteristic kind of rich smell. Um, coarse mix is the other form we'll tend to find when we open a bag of concentrate feed. And this is sometimes called a sweet feed or crunch or sweet mix. This time you don't grind up the ingredients. You mix them all together as they are. So it's basically like muesli. It's either dry or mixed with molasses. Molasses is the byproduct of sugar production. It's a dark, sticky substance. It's very sweet, so it makes the feed palatable. However, it does also make it sticky, and it means that it increases the, the sugar content of the feed, which isn't necessarily good if we have an overweight animal, for example. But we'll find most animals really like coarse mix, and will eat it very readily. This is a picture of, of um, a coarse mix without molasses, so it's this dry muesli like type mixture often you'll find um you can see there's some the round things are little squashed peas there's some maize flakes in there there's oats and barley and then there's also some small concentrate um, pellets often you'll find a few of the the nuts mixed into the coarse mix as well so the manufacturer will whatever um compounds they need to add in they'll often do so in the form of some um, nuts in there as well so how much do you feed the animal? Well, this time the manufacturer is going to print on the label of the bag some guidelines for you. So they'll tell you on the bag what nutritional information is, is in the content. So, for example, you see in the top left-hand corner here, it's telling you the ingredients and then how much vitamin E there is in each milligram of the feed and the energy concentration and so on. So next year in your Animal Husbandry and Welfare module, we'll talk you through how to interpret the specific information on a feed bag but for now what we're telling you is know how much you're feeding by weight not volume okay so people will use scoops so for example that container is called a scoop they're usually about eight or ten inches in diameter maybe six inches deep and um, people will say i'll oh, give them two scoops of course mix in the morning and one in the evening or whatever but it's actually more accurate to weigh the contents so if, if someone says you give the animal two kilos of of concentrate feed that's more accurate than say half a bucket so we do recommend that with the feeds you have in your practice weigh how much a scoop holds so one fill the scoop level with the top and then weigh it and figure out by weight how much you're feeding rather than by volume it's much more accurate and um, the other thing to bear in mind is that the manufacturer has gone to a lot of effort to ensure that the feed is going to meet the animal's energy requirements so don't add extra ingredients or supplements to a balanced ration unless there's a reason to do so people tend to like mixing things into concentrate feeds but it can actually be problematic so the advice generally is follow the manufacturer's instructions they're employing nutritionists and experts to try and balance the diet to meet the animal's needs so rather than undoing their work you're as well to follow the label requirements um the feed companies will also give you advice so for example Connolly's Red Mills are based in Goresbridge they're one of the biggest feed manufacturers in Ireland and um, there's also Gain and there's several other companies and if, if in doubt if you're having trouble feeding an animal or you want some advice ring up the company they have reps who are really really helpful very very happy to give you a hand and will help you sort out any problems you're having so that's that's well worth doing uh, and you'll find that depending on the client some animal owners are very informed about feeding and will work away themselves others may ask you for advice so it does depend on the person you do need to have some expertise to be able to guide them down the right path because a lot of problems can be avoided if the animal's on a, on a good diet okay 
Um, the next thing I want to talk through is some guidelines for feeding horses and cattle and sheep in your practice. So if you have these animals hospitalised, a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, ensure they always have access to fresh water. That's obvious. We only ever withhold water for some very specific reasons. So in general, make sure they have plenty of water. And then plenty of roughage or forage. So we're giving them usually hay or haylage in some instances to keep their gut and ruminant uh, microflora in good condition. If they've got some very highly tuned athletes or high yielding dairy cows, they may have a higher concentrate diet and have a lower roughage intake. But in general, give them plenty of roughage. Okay. Ideally, we want at least the at least uh, as a minimum 50% of the dry matter intake in the form of forage and ideally closer to three quarters of it. Okay. If the animal's pregnant, she'll need a higher energy diet in late pregnancy in the last trimester when the feet is growing rapidly and in early lactation when she's producing lots of milk. And then bear in mind that we want um, mothers to be in good body condition when they give birth. So usually about three or three and a half on a scale of zero to five. Um, if they're too thin, they're more likely to run into metabolic problems and have small underweight animals and produce less colostrum. If they're overweight, we get more dystocia, more problems given birth, um, increased risk of injury to the mother and the offspring. So that's obviously undesirable as well. So we're aiming for that, that happy medium. And then I want to finish off this section. We're just mentioning um, a few other bits and pieces. Total mixed rations you'll encounter sometimes on farm. It's basically we're taking silage and we're adding concentrate feed to it to increase nutritional value and give the animal all its energy and dietary requirements in one feed which is given to the animal on a daily basis. So a diet feeder is this piece of equipment pictured here on the left. You add your silage and your concentrates to it. It mixes it up and then you drive down the shed between the cattle pens and the machine places the ration out on the floor in front of the cattle so they can help themselves. You'll see that used on large farms, but it's not something we'll routinely use in a veterinary hospital where we're giving our patients individual diets. And then the other kind of weird and wonderful thing are these things called complete feeds. They're basically a concentrate with forage added to it. So it's a, it's a one food that provides all the animal's nutritional and forage requirements in one form. So you can see up here, this, this is a complete uh, food for horses. So it's got these large kind of clumps of forage mixed with concentrate ingredients. It's not something we'll routinely feed, but it is useful if we have animals who can't eat forage. So if, for example, they've had, say, um, a mandibular fracture that's been surgically repaired, or they've had um, damage to their esophagus, um, or they've had surgery to the head or the mouth or the tongue and they can't they can't eat um, or swallow for the moment. What we can do is we can place a tube from the animal's stomach out through the neck into the skin and then we can mix this complete feed with water to make kind of a slurry and feed the animal um, by passing food through the tube into the stomach where it's then digested. It's a very bland diet. Um, it's time consuming to do it. So it's not something we'll routinely use in practice, but just that you're aware of it. Occasionally you'll have specialised cases where animals require it for a period of time while they recover from usually some sort of um, surgery of the head or neck or the um, mouth or esophagus. Hopefully once you've completed the recovery, they can go back to their normal feed. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there for, for now on this section. The next week we go on then to look at storing and using concentrates in a veterinary hospital. Any questions, pop them up on the Moodle forum for me. Thank you.